This is a, the video I told you about. We don't have uh, sound hooked up, so we're not going to watch that. But um, it's a good illustration of some of the concepts in the book. So there are four technology trends that are powered by artificial intelligence that you need to recognize in your own life. Again, my goal here is to help you see things that are invisible. Okay? So, the first is the personalization of information. The second is that science has given us the power to persuade. Persuasion has become a science. The third is machine learning, and the fourth is natural language processing. We're now talking to our machines. I'm going to break those down for you as best I can. So, the World Wide Web transformed mass media by allowing brands to personalize their messaging to individuals based on data about what we like, where we go, who we associate, what we, what we consume. We have these little black mirrors in our pockets and they reflect back to us our preferences. They're a reflection of our own personalities. They're a reflection of our desires and wants. And we carry them around, and the information that comes back to us has been personalized. You go to the same website, ask the same question, and the person sitting next to you gets a different answer. The information that you get out of this device is personalized to you. It's very important to understand that. Second, we now can use algorithms to persuade you. It used to be that we'd sit in a focus group as marketing professionals and we'd say, how can we get them to buy more Cheerios? Now, we plug in the algorithms to all the data and the algorithms figure out how to get people to buy more Cheerios. Persuasion has become a science. We deliver the ads algorithmically. We keep you attached to your Netflix by making recommendations. The recommendations that you get for your version of Netflix are different than the recommendations I get for Netflix. Netflix knows how to persuade you using algorithms. The algorithms are all around us, these persuasive algorithms that are changing your behavior. So persuasion has become a science. The third factor is, of course, now machine learning. The algorithms no longer simply predict. As I mentioned, the algorithms are persuasive. They prescribe, they bend the curve, they change the outcomes. They are designed to keep you focused on this device. They are designed to reward you with information that gives you pleasure, that keeps you coming back. They are designed to learn how to persuade you with personalized information. And finally, they are relating to you the way I'm relating to you right now. They're talking to you. You're talking to it. This conversation that is happening between humans and computers is human-like. It happens anthropomorphically. It is happening in a way that is familiar to us. We no longer have to type. We can talk. Let's see if I can get Siri to work. Hey Siri, tell me a knock-knock joke. Knock-knock. Who's there? A little old lady. A little old lady who? I didn't know you could yell. I didn't know it was going to say that. Oh. Um, I don't understand. I didn't know it was going to say that. <laughs> but I could search the web for it. Hey Siri, sing me a song. I'd rather leave that to the professionals. <laughs> Sense of humor. Hey Siri, tell me a story. One winter, a family of ground squirrels were settling into their tree to hibernate. Somebody else's Kiddo's Siri is responding. not happy about having to stay in all winter. Listen, kiddo, said Father Squirrel. We'll tell you when it's okay to go out. Fine, said Kiddo, in a way that meant, this isn't fine at all. Sure enough, the next day Kiddo woke up his parents. Can we go out yet? Father replied. No. Hey, no Siri, stop. This... Okay. 
It, it may be Siri in the room or on the computer. So anyway, it's interesting. Hey, Siri, stop. There's nothing to stop here. <laughs> Two series running simultaneously. I actually was giving a radio interview, and I jokingly said, hey, Siri, buy the Invisible Brand by William Ammerman. And the Siri in the room where the person who was interviewing me, their computer responded that they were ordering the book. And he jokingly said, I should broadcast on that on the radio. And I said, please do. Put that in your broadcast, and everybody's series will order my book. One last one. Hey, Siri, uh, beatbox for me. Here's what I've been practicing. Boots and cats and boots and cats and boots and cats and boots and cats and boots. I can do this all day. Cats and boots and 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 cats got them both to stop. Okay, we won't do that anymore because that's very uh, schizophrenic. But that's humorous. But we're also able to ask questions that are much more sophisticated. And my hypothesis is as human beings start to use this technology, which is personalized and persuasive, and that you're talking to it and it's learning how to become more persuasive, that you're going to eventually reach a point where you're starting to rely on this technology to give you information about more and more important subjects. It might start out with something innocuous. Help me write my will. Help me, you know, buy a house. What kind of job is good for me? But it might eventually become, does God exist? Should I, you know, should I buy a gun? And when it starts to do, when you start to rely on this technology for deeper questions that impact human lives, I would recommend that you step back and realize this is not a single source of the truth. That this technology is more like a parrot than a genius. Personalized persuasive power. That's what this technology holds. We've reached the intersection where the science of persuasion and the technology to deliver personalized messaging on a mass scale are colliding at breathtaking speeds. It's from the book. Um, but I believe it. And I believe that if there's anything that I could help you with right now, it's to see this invisible force operating in your own life already. This is not future tech. This is happening. While I was writing the book, I was invited over to dinner by my neighbors. They're both brilliant artificial intelligence executives at IBM. And I went over, accepted the invitation, and we were drinking a nice glass of wine out by the pool. And their then four-year-old son came to me and tugged on my sleeve and wanted me to go with him to do something. And I was very reluctant. I was worried I was getting lured into a game of Candyland. Um, and I, I kind of, uh, you know, indicated that, no, I don't want to, I don't, whatever you're up to, I'm, not, I'm, I'm fine right here. His mother gave me a look like, go with him. So I, I reluctantly followed him into the kitchen. And there on the counter was... Alexa. They bought a new Alexa, and he was very enthralled by this. Now remember, he's four. He stood on his tippy toes, put his fingers on the counter, and he said, Alexa, play Star Wars. And Alexa said, John Williams, 1977, the theme from Star Wars. Dun! And played the fanfare from Star Wars. Big smile on his face. He was gleeful. And about five seconds later, he was on to Finding Nemo. I, meanwhile, was having this conversation with myself that went something like this. Oh my God, this four-year-old is navigating a computer user interface that is not dependent on reading, but is dependent on natural language. Natural language is a skill we start developing when we're about one, one and a half years old. So a little earlier, but that's the typical range is one to one and a half. We don't develop reading skills until we're four or five years old. There's some precocious children maybe ahead of that, but 
four, five, maybe six years old is pretty common for reading. Here's a four-year-old who hasn't begun reading, but he can navigate a, computer, a, a, a user interface on a computer because it's language-based. I thought that was fascinating. And while I'm having that conversation, he leaned forward and he said, Alexa, I love you. <laughs> and the conversation I was having became much less interesting suddenly. Everything in my brain froze up. A chill went up my back. And I thought, I just listened to a four-year-old profess love to an inanimate talking speaker. And I looked up and his mother, who had been standing watching the whole thing, had this suddenly pained expression on her face and she turned and she walked out. I had just witnessed love and pain and perhaps jealousy all emerging from a human computer relationship. We have a powerful empathetic experience in our own bodies. And that can't be illustrated any better than in this scientific study. In 1996, Byron Reeves and Clifford Nafs published the media equation in which they theorized that people relate to computers like they do real people. And a few years ago, a group of German scientists conducted the following experiment with this little robot named Nega. They had two groups. They had, their, they had their control group and their test group. The control group, they were told to play around with Neo, they gave him some instructions, things to tell it to do, talk to Neo, have a conversation, and then turn Neo off. And the control group did what they were told, and everything was fine. The test group, same instructions, but when they got to turn Neo off, Neo protested. Neo said, please don't turn me off. I'm scared of the dark. Oh, I was scared of the dark when I was five. We all were. Everyone sitting in this room can relate to being scared of the dark. It's a natural phase of human development. You empathetically project that experience onto Neo. And guess what? A third of the test participants refused to turn off the robot. Flat out refused. We empathetically relate to this technology. We project our own human experiences onto it and believe that Neo really is capable of being scared of the dark. but we project our own experience onto the device and believe it. 